Screens. This great movie written and directed by Rupert Haverett, who also plays the main role, so the role of Oscar Wilde. This could be defined the last picture, not of Darren Gray this time, but of Oscar Wilde, so not of the catcher, but of the artist. Okay. Why the last picture? Well, this is just because it's the last representation we've got of Oscar Wilde, yes. It could be also the last picture because it represents the last frame, the last moments of his life. But probably uh, it's more about being the ultimate uh, representation of Oscar Wilde. So, for sure, um, Wilde and Dorian Gray, his fictional character, had a lot in common. They were trying somehow to crystallize sort of an hedonistic ideal of beauty and of life, and they both fell under its weight. On one side in fiction, in, uh, in the picture of Dorian Gray, uh, the protagonist uh, gets to know also the negative effects, of the, uh, we can say the unhappiness of, this, uh, of stopping time, okay, of trying to fix beauty, uh, because uh, he also experiences loneliness and, and lost. And when he finally has to face his portrait, his, his, his picture, uh, which uh, represented all the uh, negative effects of his life, a life, a dissolute life full of excesses, of corruption, he isn't able to take it. Uh, he's shocked. He decides or he has to stab uh, the picture and while doing it, uh, he is killing himself. Well, um, we can say that uh, he dies because of his useless uh, uh, intention of saving youth. On the other side, Oscar Wilde, well, he withers, okay, he fades step by, by step throughout his, his, his life. He experiences all the signs of excesses, of uh, his choices, of corruption probably, but he always tries to uh, be faithful to that ideal, the ideal of art for art's sake, which isn't only an artistic ideal, because it, all, it is also a representation of life in his case. So art for art's sake, sake, it means that art doesn't have another purpose, another aim, but its own perfection. And same as life, okay? The final aim is to reach perfection. This is something that, uh, that somehow is destined to collapse in itself and to crumble. So, uh, The Happy Prince tries to represent not only the artist, but especially the human being, especially the man. But in this case, in White's case, it's extremely difficult to, to divide them, to split them. You have to represent them together. They belong together somehow. And probably for this reason, uh, White's life is uh, um, is uh, told or uh, is uh, um, somehow has a sort of a light motive, which is a short story that Wilde wrote, The Happy Prince. Okay, The Happy Prince is a story, short story, a tale of this prince that was actually like a statue. It was a statue, so statue means it should be the symbol of immortality. Okay. And uh, um, it was something, it should have been something crystallized, but it isn't true because it crumbles at the end. Okay, there is this swallow, this bird that decides to stop and help the happy prince to sacrifice himself for his people. And still both of them die and uh, their sacrifice isn't recognized and they're just thrown away as rubbish. But in that moment they achieve salvation. Okay, they, uh, they, uh, they can say they reach salvation. Now, our Oscar Wilde isn't a prince, he isn't just a happy prince 
or a sad prince at times, he's a king. He's the king of asceticism, not only in England probably. And still this man, he gets smutty and indecent and uh, he almost uh, um, chokes on uh, his own vomit. And this image of him is extremely antithetic to the idea of the king of asceticism. This is the king of unasceticism somehow. He's a man who dares. He dares to, uh, to love uh, and to go over probably the limits of love, but it's not a very aesthetic ideal of love actually. He, love, he loves, uh, he loves uh, love. <laughs> he loves the feeling. Uh, he loves uh, a man, Bozy. He loves art. He loves uh, his own search for success. And he loves himself, most of all. And this is the Oscar Wilde uh, we can see here. The Oscar Wilde that uh, has some selfish sides, uh, that has got some kind of recklessness and excesses, and the courage of this movie. In my opinion, the courage of this movie is that there is no need of idealism, no need of heroism there. This is just the way it is. Even the, the, the work, the profundis, um, it's extremely painful, it's extremely tormented, but it, it isn't and it doesn't want to be any manifesto of ideals. This is not what it is meant to be. It's just like a desperate shout of humanity, of genuine humanity. So, um, in the metaphorical uh, crucifixion of Oscar Wilde, which is extremely painful too, at the station uh, when he is under arrest and people and society uh, is humiliating him because of his so-called considered at the time sin, which was homosexuality. This crucifixion um, is compared to, the, to the, cruci the crucifixion of Jesus when Wilde receives his extreme unction. It could be or could be considered a little blasphemous maybe, but it isn't because this is just a representation of human sacrifice, okay, as the happy prince and the swallow sacrifice themselves, okay. So it's the human sacrifice, but in this case our man is unredeemed, probably doesn't want to be redeemed either. So this is, as I said before, the Oscar Wilde of excesses, of orgies, of eccentricity, Okay, the eccentricity of a dandy that explodes in the sky as a bright stars. And just in that moment we can see all his dark sides and all of his shadows, which are terrifying sometimes. There is a really great splendid interpretation by Rupert Everett, absolutely powerful, believable, uh, both in English and French, and uh, it's a, a, some, somehow it's a merciless. And uh, there is also an awesome interpretation by Colin Morgan, this incredible talent from Northern Ireland, with his grace, his balanced grace, he is really able to represent such a difficult and a, a sort of a multifaceted uh, image and I'm talking about Bosey, so Sir Alfred Douglas, Wilde's most important lo love, okay? This man that was uh, both angelic on one side and extremely erotic on the other side, it was sweet on one side and really cruel on the other side, a man who probably was unaware, okay, he, he wasn't completely aware of the abyss, of the abyss of the, the profundis, but still he 
bloomed, he had bloomed in that habit, and he also faded, he also died in that habit, along with Oscar Wilde, not at the same time, though. Okay, so this is a very strong movie. This is a very strong movie, maybe a little bit too emphasized in some aspects, but still it really... Um, uh, it, it really uh, reach its, uh, its aim, the aim to celebrate and to restore uh, a great and a very important artist and man. Just, we have just to think about that uh, Oscar Wilde was restored in 2017, so it was just last year, okay, for his so-called guilt, okay, of being homosexual. This is incredible. This is terrible if, if we think about that today. On the other side, uh, the um, great side, the great uh, um, aspect of this movie is uh, also the demystification of any kind of abstraction. Okay, because abstraction doesn't really belong to Oscar Wilde. Um, it is. Uh, uh, it also uh, tries to display the highest and the lowest side of humanity, of the human being. And these sides, both these sides, often belong together. They often coexist. They even, we can say that they even coincide most of the times. So, this is a great movie and uh, it's also a proof that Oscar Wilde is still teaching us something. He has, he has something to teach to our society uh, today as well, and he's challenging and shaking and shattering our own certainties today as well. So, my suggestion is to watch this movie and uh, never stop, stop reading literature, because it is always something extremely modern and powerful. Bye!